Um, so today's lecture, we're just uh, continuing with uh, topic two. Uh, in particular, what we've done so far is we introduced uh, two frameworks for um, you know, trying to assess the quality of investment opportunities in the startup space. Uh, one framework was focused on the project, right? And the other one was, uh, was focused on uh, the team or the, the founders. Um, you know, if you looked at both frameworks, I mean, what we did is we just basically laid out a bunch of questions and um, provided some justification for why people would think those things, at least in some situations, are extremely important, right? Um, but, you know, at the end, at end of the day, we basically ended up with I'm just guessing the number, right? Let's call it like 10 questions to ask about the project, 10 questions to ask about the people, right? Um, and one of the things that I've, I think, been repeating on multiple occasions over the course and, and within this topic is that, you know, you don't want to view these, let's call it 20 questions, uh, as uh, checklists, right? You don't want to be thinking of a project as it's good if it doesn't have any weakness in the checklist, right? Um, you know, it turns out that, you know, if you look at the truly outstanding projects, right, the truly outstanding investments made by VC over time, those were not checklist deals. They were not deals where something looked pretty good, pretty solid everywhere. Um, that's not how it works. Um, instead, you know, on a case by case basis, you look at the checklist and you look at the reality of your project and team. And what you actually want to do is far more subtle, which is you want to identify what subsets of the checklist are most important in this current context. And then you want to look for excellence on those dimensions. And you want to try to understand what, I don't know what the opposite of excellence is. Um, whatever, negative excellence. Um, you know, you want to kind of figure out what can, what, what, for what dimensions is it okay to have negative excellence? What, what's a word for negative? I've, I've been up a long time. What's negative excellence? Someone tell me, please. Weakness. Oh, shit. Yeah, that's right. You know, what weaknesses are, 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 are acceptable, tolerable, right? And what this basically boils down to is, how do you weigh the frameworks? They're not equal weighted, right? A checklist is kind of saying equal weighted. Or it's almost like you, you want to maximize the minimum, the, the minimum check, you know? Uh, that's, not, that's not what you want to do, right? So first thing we're going to talk about today is some perspective um, from practitioners and from empirical evidence uh, about what are some broad things we know about weighing these frameworks? Now, I don't want to misrepresent things. Uh, it's not like I'm going to give you like this, you know, amazing user guide on weighing frameworks, where like now all of a sudden, every time an investment opportunity comes to your doorstep, you'll look at it and then you know, oh, this is one of them like question one, seven, nine, ten for project framework and question two, four, and six for the founder framework. Those are the ones that matter here. I know it because it's in this guide, you know, that I learned in VC on Thursday, October 8, 2020. Uh, no, right? It's not going to be like that. Um, and in fact, I'm going to say, you, you might actually be surprised at how little guidance I give you on this. You guys are like, why in the world did I come here today then? Um, because look, the reality is, is it's super subtle, super subtle. And it's like, I don't even know for myself, like I just, I'm trying to get myself to the point where I feel I can kind of come up with my own judgments on a case by case basis, given new things I figure out every time I'm presented with a new opportunity to try to at least take a stab at knowing what weaknesses are tolerable and what strengths need to shine. But actually, you know, what I'll say is, if you emerge from this part of our discussion with um, 
an appreciation for the fact that this is important and, um, you know, uh, a desire to be aware that you should learn about this gradually over time. I mean, actually, if you exit from this lecture with just that, uh, that might actually still be pretty good. Um, because a lot of, a lot of people actually think checklist, right? And then you never, you never invest in anything revolutionary if it's checklist, because when you want to invest, everyone wants to invest. So we'll talk about frameworks and how, I mean, specifically how to weigh them. Um, but again, I don't want to overpromise on what I'm going to deliver here. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about forecasting future opportunities as well, which is very helpful within the context of trying to decide what in a framework is important. And, um, and it relates to the notion of timing, which we generally view as being one of the things that's almost universally important. That's, that's one part of a framework that people almost generally always say, you know, timing, timing is one that's there all the time. Okay, so uh, I'm going to go and share my slides eventually. Ah, there we go. All right, so you guys can see my slides. All right, yeah, so yeah, this is just frameworks. How do we weigh them? How do we organize them? Yeah. Kind of depends on the space you've got, right? Same thing, how you, how you do it kind of depends on the project you've got. So, um, you know, when I, when I think of it, like, let's think about it, right? Th this is a complex problem, right? Because, you know, if you think about it, think of the dimensionality of this problem, right? If we think weighing frameworks and we've got 20 characteristics spread across the people and the project framework. Let's even like make it super simple where it's like, you know, on a given situation, one question is either important or not important. So for every of 20, you've got a zero or a one. Well, we know two to the power of 20 is over a million. So there's like a million different ways that we could be weighing this framework. That's a lot. Um, and so I don't want to start with trying to understand a million different ways. That's too much for me. That's too difficult. I like to start with something simpler, right? That I still think carries a lot of essence. Um, and so I'm going to start with the simplest version of the weighing frameworks question that I can think of. And that simplest question is a question that gets asked and debated all the time in startup circles, VC circles, which is uh, what do you prioritize? What's more important, the project or the people? Is it about the idea or is it about the team? Sometimes people call it the horse versus the jockey, where the horse is the project, the jockey is the people. What's more important? That is like the simplest cut and maybe one of the more fundamental cuts of this weighing projects framework, right? So let's try to think about what, what we know about, um, you know, what sort, of, what sort of insights and facts and arguments we can, we can collect that might be helpful in, um, in answering this question or in formulating an opinion on this question. Let's be clear, actually. Everything that I'm saying right now is going to be an opinion, okay? And there's, you can find cases where what I say is wrong, right? I'm just trying to say, like, on average, maybe there's some sensibility to, what, to the points I'll be making. And so I'm going to start by giving you guys um, a little bit of nerdy academic research, but I'm not going to overgo into the details. Um, it's uh, research by this fellow right here. Uh, this is Steve Kaplan. He's a finance professor at the University of Chicago at the Booth School of Business. Um, he basically developed the whole VC curriculum at, um, at Booth. Um, and actually, University of Chicago has a pretty successful startup accelerator slash kind of startup pitch competition. Um, and 
he's played basically a leading role in developing that uh, really great guy. Um, and he's probably one of the most famous academic researchers in venture capital in the world. He was the advisor of my advisor in grad school. Um, so he's done a bunch of interesting research, but I wanna talk about one specific research project here. An interesting thing is I actually agree in some ways and disagree in other ways about his conclusions. And so in particular, he has a research project that looks into this horse versus jockey question. And in particular, look, venture capital is a difficult thing to do academic research in because it's difficult to get data. And academic research is either theoretical or it's data driven. He's not a theoretician, so he needs to be data driven. Most people are not able to get a lot of comprehensive data on VC stuff because it's private transactions. He is a fabulous networker and he's somehow managed to do it. Um, so he's done a bunch of research based off of proprietary data that he has from basically getting his network to share data on their contracts, data on their investments, so on and so forth. And in this particular research project, he kept track of startups that VCs invested at the time that the VC invested in them and how those startups evolved over time subsequently. Because he was able to get his contacts to share with him the investment transaction, but also investment memos repeatedly over time so that you can see what's happening to this company over time. And in his research project, Steve posits that the horse is way more important than the jockey. He says, it's all about the horse, baby. He doesn't say baby, I added that one. That's my contribution. Um, but the, here's, the, here's his, the reasoning. The reasoning is simple. You don't need to be technical to know this. If you, look at the pro, if you look at the startups in his data set, almost always the project remains unchanged through the startup's evolution. So from the date he starts tracking it, it, there's only like a couple of instances in his data set where there was a material change to the business. Things like changing a market. Sure. Yeah. Um, for, for this uh, research, was there a, a control for the stage of funding? So like, was it, were they seeing- We're gonna get to that. We're gonna get to that, I promise. Okay. Um, so what I can tell you is what the typical stages he tracked at. His data was a few series A, mostly like series B and beyond. Yeah, because I, I was only asking because if it's series A, series B and beyond, it's more likely that the, the, the companies pass a certain threshold for the probability of change within the quote unquote horse is a so lot you're, lower. You're picking, yeah, so Kanishka is actually picking up on what is my main criticism of this paper in terms of thinking about how general the statement he makes is, right? So uh, you're literally, you pick up exactly what I'm, what I'm planning, what, what, I, uh, what, what I'm gonna, gonna be highlighting as an, a nuance that, that he, he doesn't highlight, but that I think is true and that you clearly think is true. Um, uh, about horse versus jockey in the real world and how that evolves over the life cycle of a startup, okay? But let's first kind of see what he did, see how he interprets it, and then, you know, I'll give my interpretation that's a little bit different and that is exactly what you're saying, okay? So, so yeah, so he finds, look, um, the project almost never changes once you get to series A, series B, et cetera. But you, it's not unusual to see key executives change. Right? So his view is, look, you know, the initial key executives that you have right now are less important because you can swap them out. But you better have the project right because that's pretty much not changing in the data that he's looking at. Right? So that means, you know, you want to pay ultra attention to the stuff you can't fix if, if it proves to not be well suited. And the evidence for him at the stages that he looks at 
is that the project is never is not going to be changing in a material manner. So you better make sure the details are right now. Kira. Yep. Is this all concentrated in the states, or is this data is all the U.S. in this particular case? Yeah. Okay, so it's probably mostly startups out of the valley. No, it's scattered around the U.S. So he's got networks in New York City and Chicago. I mean, there are other startup ecosystems in. In. Uh, I just wanted to know if this is like something that is like a nuance to a specific geography. Because if you look globally, like startup ecosystems are vastly different in like Europe. Yeah. And look, I mean. We always have to be careful to overgeneralize, right? And that's particularly true when we look at academic research in VC, because the data is so, you know, driven by the people you know. And so if, if you're, the people you know are systematically Bay Area or systematically Montreal, or, right, then you, you don't have the, you, you, you're, you aren't technically describing the whole world. And there's probably heterogeneity across the world that you just won't be able to pick up on. So that's certainly true. Right. So take, you know, take things with a grain of salt, but let's just try to get what we can get out of it. Right. You know, there's, I, you know, there's something about, there's something kind of VC like about this actually, which is like, look, especially early stage VC. Um, what, what Kanishk and, and Mike are, are picking up on is we would love to have a better data set that had all the different nuances, all the different covariates so that we could get a much more comprehensive picture of what matters. I mean, we all agree that that's true. The problem is that doesn't exist, right? And so you need to be more opportunistic and you need to like triangulate between data and logic much more in this environment because the data alone doesn't give you enough. There, there's nothing you can do. You know, there's nothing I can do. Like, there's not realistic that I can get buddies all at all the ecosystems in the world to give me their data. It's never gonna happen, so I gotta do the best that I can do. And the best I can do is when I can find data, I look at it, but I always need to question in what ways is this not fully representative? So let's look at it in terms of Steve's um, uh, paper. He says, horse baby, but the thing is, exactly as you guys point out, what he's actually found is, Horse baby in my data set, baby, right? And his data set is actually not really that early stage. It's a little bit more like once you reach aggressive scaling, maybe a little, go, little bit of go-to-market fit. And so what I draw from his research is that once you reach aggressive scaling, you better have the project right. So you gotta investigate the hell out of a project to make sure that you are a firm believer in that thing. People are less important because your company is doing relatively well. You're in aggressive scaling. So if the people aren't right, you just swap them out and bring some new better folks in. And so actually, when I think more carefully about the data that he has, I'm not surprised by the conclusion he draws. Because- I a question. Oh, sorry. Maybe just one second. Because when we were thinking and describing the startup life cycle, it was pretty clear. When is the project chart changing the most? The project is changing by far the most when you're searching for product market fit. And then it's changing maybe a little bit, but it might be difficult to notice from the investment memo whether it's changing in go-to-market fit. And then it's really not changing that dramatically thereafter. And so because of that, I agree with what he says, but only for the stuff he looked at. And I believe that what he found is very non-representative of the early stage. In the early stage, the project changes so much. And what do you actually want? What you actually want is a founding team that you have faith will discover the changes necessary to get you to the promised land. See what I'm saying? Like, what would you prefer having? An idea that sounds pretty compelling, but with the wrong team? Or would you like a wrong team that has a, a, a you know, they have an interesting vision, compelling vision, but the details seem off, but you know they're gonna experiment like crazy and they're gonna quickly discover that the details are off and 
navigate towards something a little bit better. To me, that's more important. And so this is my view, and it's a view that's shared by many, many, many practitioners, which is the way you weigh horse versus jockey changes between early stage and growth stage or later stage. In the growth stage, yes, the project matters most. But in the early stage, actually, the people matter more because they're the ones there's so much uncertainty, no one has the right project to begin with. So it's so important to have a team that's going to make pivots, iterations, adjustments that bring you closer to the right thing as you learn, launch, learn, launch, et cetera. Right, and that's something that, I mean, it surprised me a little bit. It's not actually even discussed in his paper, uh, in uh, Steve's paper. Um, I mean, that's one thing with academic research is academics oftentimes feel the need to make a statement as general as possible, even if that doesn't make sense. Um, I think he tried to over push the generality of his message, but I believe his message in the actual stuff that he looked at. So, you know, I believe his finding, I just think he tried to push it a little bit too hard in terms of saying it's all only the horse that matters or it's mo mostly the horse, that, it's not always true. And in fact, it's not difficult to find early stage VCs that are gonna be telling you precisely the opposite, which is that it's all about the people. So here I've got a picture of uh, the three, th three co-founders of ClearBank, which is probably one of Canada's hottest FinTech companies right now. You might notice the person in the middle. Um, She's like one of the Canadian sharks, Michelle Romano. Um, actually, uh, this is Charlie Feng. He's like uh, a recent graduate of Des Hotels, 2013 or so. Um, and this is Andrew D'Souza. So they're the, they're the three main founders of ClearBank. Um, it's an interesting company. I won't talk about the company, but if you click on this slide, um, Andrew is talking about his perspectives on angel investing. And it's very clear when he's talking that he puts way more weight on the founders and to some extent the vision as opposed to the detail of the project and much less weight on the detail of the project. And he specifically says it's because the project's gonna change and it can change, right? So one instance of document documentable video evidence uh, consistent with what I'm saying, but I'm telling you, if you go dig up YouTube videos where early stage founders talk about what they pay most attention to when they're, uh, when they're making early stage investment, they emphasize the people more often than they emphasize nitty gritty questions about the project. Now that's not to say the project questions don't matter, but just on average, the founder characteristics are weighed more than you know, the average weight on the uh, project characteristics. Folks okay with this? By the way, this is probably, this is, probably, this is the, the rule of weight that I believe the most in. When I, when I look at an early stage project, I'm more focused on the team. Later on, I'm scrutinizing as many elements of the, found, of the project framework as I can. And I'm getting into the math, into the unit economics and stuff like that. And I, I don't think I'm the only one who does it. In fact, you know, probably that's gonna be a question that I'll ask Alex and Mia at their session next week. You guys received an email where I announced that, right? So I'll ask them, I feel pretty confident they're gonna say, something reasonably close to what I just said. But I could be wrong, so I'm going out on a limb here. Sound good? Um, here, here's a great video. Um, I think I mentioned that I thought it was a great video, maybe at the end of our last content lecture. Um, it's a TED Talk by Bill Gross. Bill Gross is a serial, uh, serial entrepreneur. 
very successful as an entrepreneur, um, and eventually founded one of the first uh, startup accelerator programs. Oh, no, I'm sorry, startup incubator programs. An incubator comes up with the idea themselves and starts building it inside. An accelerator you know, provides training and a little bit of money to people who come up with the idea and come, come ask them to be part of their accelerator. So he was more incubator, where they would ideate from within. Um, and so he gives a TED talk on what he believes is most important. Look, he's an incubator, so he's an early stage kind of person, right? Incubation is pretty much ground zero, right? And so he talks about the things that he finds most important. And he actually ended up also being fairly systematic. He went and scored a bunch of things that were started through Idea Lab. Uh, by, the, by the way, Idea Lab is based out of the Los Angeles area in Southern California. I think it was the first startup incubator um, in Southern California, actually. Um, but he goes and scores. He doesn't use the same framework as me. Probably no one does. Um, but not exactly, but there's still a lot of commonality. Um, but he looks at five dimensions. He looks at um, the idea, the team, the business model, how much financing things have, and timing. He looks at those five characteristics. And what he did is he scored over 100 startups that went both either through his, uh, his incubator so that he knows it super well, or that are startups that he knows a fair amount about and that ended up becoming either you know, substantial successes or substantial failures. So things that are a little bit more in public domain. Right, think of like um, you know, a pets.com, you know, if public domain became a pretty big failure and uh, you know, Airbnb, which you know, at this, you know, look, it you know, became obviously a huge success. Um, and so he scored empirically, right? So he went and created a data set where he scored on those five dimensions over a hundred different things and then classified which of those things became successes, which of them became failures. And then he looked to see what seemed to matter most. And what he found is that the thing that mattered the most was timing. Thing that mattered second most, and let's remember this is early stage, was team. Third was the idea. Fourth was business model. Fifth was financing. So business model and financing, he said, look, it's not that important early on because if things start to work, you can start to figure out the business model and you can start to raise funding even if you don't have funding yet. Right? So those ones not being so important, perhaps not so surprising. But out of the remaining three, the idea, which we think, I think of that as being the details of the project, was the third in importance. The team was higher. He does also, like Andrew D'Souza, emphasize the fact that teams need to be adaptive. I think he says a quote about like, um, he actually, I think he quotes Mike Tyson, if I recall, where he's like, apparently Mike Tyson was talking about the personality characteristics of his opponents. He's a boxer, I'm sure. Well, you guys might know him as an actor, but he was once a boxer. Um, um, and um, so he was a boxer that would scare the living shit out of other boxers. And he said, look, you know, you see a big difference between different types of opponents because what you end up seeing is you have some opponents that talk the talk and seem all tough until you punch them in the face and then it's a different story. And then you have the ones that can take it. He's like, you know, you want to bet in founders that are going to be the ones that can be punched and take it. You need to be able to react to adversity. You need to be able to make adjustments when something isn't working and it's getting you punched in the face. Um, um, yeah, it's actually not, not a bad quote. Um, I may have slightly incorrectly quoted it because I haven't seen the video myself in a, in a long time. Um, but I do remember it was an outstanding video. Um, but yeah, so team, he emphasizes the need for a team to be adaptive and to be perseverant in adversity, right? So that also tells you some of like what he views as the most important characteristics within the founder framework as well. 
But then he talks about timing and you know, why timing matters so much. Um, remember, timing was, you know, even the, remember, I said, look, the, for early stage, the, um, the founder framework matters more, but timing is part of the project framework, right? Remember pain points? Pain, the N in pain was now, which is timing. So even though you put more weight on founders, you still put a lot of weight on one piece, at least one piece of the project framework, which is the now of it. Why now? It's very helpful to have a justification for why a startup idea makes sense now in a way that didn't make sense before, especially if it's a big idea. Because if it's a big idea and it could have been done 10 years ago, it's quite possible someone tried. And if someone else tried before and failed, I mean, it does suggest that maybe you have a higher likelihood of failure as well, that there's something really difficult about, about doing that thing. By the way, that's one of the first questions that I always ask young founders when they come to me is why are you doing this now? Why couldn't it have been done before? Has it been tried before? So first of all, it's amazing how often people don't know if it's been tried before. It's also amazing how often the answer is it could have been done before and the founder doesn't realize that that's something they should be worried about, which also makes me question their naivete, right? Timing plays such an important role. I mean, let's think of some examples. So he actually mentions two examples, if I recall. He talks about um, YouTube, and he contrasts YouTube to something that was quite similar to YouTube that Idealab tried to launch several years before YouTube. It was, a, it was something, I think it was called Z.com. And it was a failure, even though they had way more money than YouTube had at the beginning. Literally, like they were even able to produce content and they wanted to basically distribute that stuff over the web. The problem is the timing for Z.com was not good. It was in the early days of broadband. So most people, if they wanted to watch a 30 second video, they had to like unplug their telephone. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with telephones the thing that came before the cell phone. Um, they had to like unplug that, plug that into like, like this like dial up modem. Then you would hear the and you'd be basically there for like 30 minutes to watch your 30 second video. And not just that, every video file you would get was a different format. So you'd have to go download the right video player for that format, got to plug that thing in again. Okay, two hours later, you got the, you got the video thingy. Yeah, it doesn't strike me as a great user experience, does it? Right? So Z.com, nope, bad timing. YouTube starts when you have much, much, much higher broadband penetration. Right? Um, much broad, right? And they did, you know, the, what, 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 what YouTube did, sorry, what YouTube did is you send them a video, you upload a video, it's in your format but they would convert every video into a common format flash so that you only needed one player. One player, you can start watching the video quickly, much better user experience. In fact, that was way more important than having good content because do you guys know what the initial content on like YouTube was? It was basically videos of nerds partying or cats, right? So you didn't even need great content, but you needed to have great timing. Like I find that to be such a nicely illustrative observation. Because look, at the end of the day, Z.com had a similar idea to YouTube. It's just they were too early. The technology wasn't ready. Look, I could give other examples, but um, you know, I think 
you know, if you think of like Uber, Airbnb, and think about how important the timing was for the sharing economy, that you had people that were on the supply side of the market that needed money because of an economic downturn. And that was what would get them to be like, you know, I'm not super comfortable with letting a stranger into my house, but fuck it, I need the money. Meanwhile, in, in good economic times, be like, what are you talking about? Timing. Jiro. Yeah. So I watched the video, I thought it was really good as well. One thing I was wondering, maybe I just missed it in the video, but on what metric is he measuring like a startup success, right? Because the startups he uses are so different from each other that like, how can you say, okay, this startup is like super successful and this one, yeah. like obviously if it fails, it's no longer around, it failed. Yeah. Like what is success? Yeah, so like, you know, alas, I have never spoken to this human being in my life. So my, the, the, the information I have to work on is the same information you have to work on, which is this video. I'm just taking a leap of faith, which is just, I, I assume he scored it reasonably well. I don't know how he did it, but I just have faith that he knows what he's doing. Um, but I have, to, I, have to, I have to accept that because if I want to question every detail, I will never know the answer. So uh, you look, your point is well taken. You always want, if you can, you like to do due diligence on the claims that people make where they said they've looked at data because you can always cherry pick stuff if you want. But I believe in his conclusion, because I'm actually pretty sure if he wanted to cherry pick, he probably would have made sure that the idea came first. I mean, he called his fucking accelerator idea lab. I mean, I would think that that suggests an initial bias on the idea, but I could be wrong, right? Uh, but yeah, yeah, look, you always, I mean, yeah, I mean, I really wish we could dot our I's and cross our T's here, but it's just not possible. Like, we're not even given a pencil. So, um, so there's a lot of stuff that's done on faith and a lot of stuff that's done actually less on direct data and more on, on logic, right? A lot of what I'm trying to say is, it's more like we've seen a bunch of examples kind of disparate scattered around and we just try to kind of massage a plausible logical framework to make sense of it all. Is it exactly correct? Probably not. Is it okay? I hope so. Folks okay with this? So timing, timing is something that seems to matter a lot. So regardless of whether you're early stage or late stage, I would probably pay attention to that. And honestly, you know, Timing is probably one that matters more early stage than later stage. Because once you get to late stage, the timing has already happened. You're, you're off and running. I mean, I don't know, like there can be things where, you know, timing just ends up working super well or super badly for you even in the later stage, right? So maybe like if we think about what, I mean, look, let's think about, you know, one aspect of timing that we didn't really know would happen until it happened is this situation right now, right? Pandemic. Well, the pandemic has changed things for, not for all startups, but for some startups, and it's created some winners and some losers, right? So like if you are, um, well, I think I mentioned, right? There's this McGill dropout who founded Chronometric, which is basically uh, provides you know, digital kind of IT type services to help with patient booking and some other patient relationship stuff for doctors. Um, they've benefited from what's happened because now people very much want to have want to be able to do all the pre booking stuff online and be told to the minute when they're gonna see the doctor so that they don't need to go wait in a waiting room you know, for three hours. We know how it works in Montreal sometimes. You wanna avoid that now. So guess what? Things have been going well. They actually just changed their name to Pomelo Health. Um, 
it's not a it's not a rebrand because they think they need to rebrand it's like literally a rebrand that represents them wanting to scale their ambition and it has to do with some additional traction that they've gotten during these times so this is an example where you've got good timing uh at the late stage because you know this happened when chronometric was already um was already a scale up But most of the time when you're just kind of looking at the world right now and saying like, is now the good time to do this? It, it tends to be on average, more of an early stage question. Folks okay with this? So uh, Mark Andreessen again, strengths versus weaknesses. So if you don't believe me when I say that you don't want to invest solely on the basis of, uh, of a checklist and that what you want to do instead is find an opportunity that look that has that like super shines on some of the most important strength dimensions and that in the process of doing that you just have no choice you need to accept that there's going to be some very important or some some material uh, weaknesses you don't believe me when i say it click that video it's like two minutes he says exactly what i just said you know but uh you know with more authority and more facial hair. Actually, in the video, he doesn't have facial hair, so I, I lie. I have another video here. This is Fred Wilson. He is the founding uh, venture partner at Union Square Ventures, New York City-based VC, that from basically 2004 till 2016 was really one of the best performing venture firms across multiple funds um, in, in the world, full stop. Um, you know, they did early stage investments in Twitter, uh, several, other, several other companies as well. Um, so he, he has an interesting tidbit here. By the way, he's one of the people that I, when I sent you guys that list of blogs to follow, he was one of the people on that list. He, he, I think he blogs every single day. So you know, he's one of these, he's a volume guy. Gurley is the quality per unit guy. Um, so his, his stuff is hit or miss, but nonetheless, it's still kind of nice to see. Um, but he has an interesting statement about, um, about, um, about how he thinks about frameworks, or at least this is my interpretation of what he says. He doesn't say it exactly the way that I say it, which is you want to narrow your framework to your own skill set. Like, you yourself, if you're a VC, you should be, you should have self-awareness too. You should be like, I know how to judge this, but I don't know how to judge this. And if you don't know how to judge this, you might want to invest in things where that thing you can't judge is not that important. So Fred basically mentions this in a very specific manner, in a very specific context. He talks about whether he invests pre-product or you know, pre-MVP or post-MVP. And he says, look, I don't invest pre-MVP or pre-demo. I don't remember which of the two he says, but I would call a, de a demo the, an MVP anyway. So it's neither here nor there from my perspective. But he says, look, before there's a demo, I don't invest. He's like, look, I'm not able to decide whether I think something is really good until I actually see it and feel it. That's super important for him. And so that guides how he uses a framework because the stuff in the framework that's about identifying potential before a product, product is actually there. So about really understanding a problem without having the benefit of a concrete thing to gauge what's happening to the problem after you introduce something to it. Like he says, look, I'm just, I am not good at that. So A, I don't invest pre-product and B, you know, I'm, you know, that means that my framework looks a little bit different from people who invest, who invest pre-product. -pre See what I'm saying? Right? So think about how you tailor both how you use your framework and what kinds of things you're willing to invest in, tailor that to you, the investor, right? So you're not just looking for self-awareness on the part of founders, 
you yourself want to have self-awareness. He doesn't look like he approves anything I'm saying right now. Fred, what's up? Sorry, that's a, <laughs> I should not quit my day job. Even if I'm forced to be all alone in a big building. Um, okay, so I've got a bunch of videos that all say the same thing, which is this notion of being contrarian and right. George Zachary, Charles River Ventures, he says it. Howard Marks, Oak Tree Capital. I'm pretty sure I mentioned him before. He's like the person who popularized this concept. He's not even a VC. He's a distressed debt investor. But he's said time and time again that one of the main things he anchors for making his big bets in his hedge fund, which is Oak Tree Capital, is can he identify situations where he is contrarian to the market, where the market believes A and he believes not A, and he thinks that relative to normal times when he's contrarian, that he's much more likely to be right than normal. It doesn't mean he's guaranteed to be right, but if when you're a contrarian, you're right normally 2% of the time, he's like, I try to find the cases where I think I'm gonna be right 10% of the time. Uh, he doesn't quote those numbers. I'm kind of taking the liberty to quote numbers for him. Um, but yeah, uh, I mean, VCs, keep track, like follow him. That tells you how impactful this guy is in terms of the logic of investment. He actually has written an amazing book called The Most Important Thing. Have I told you guys this before? No? Because I don't know what I've told to ACF and VC anymore. It's kind of become a mush. But um, I'll say it again anyway, because it's important enough to say twice, read that book. If I was structuring the program at Des Hotels for finance, I would make it required reading in year one, which I don't know whether that means U0 or U1, but whatever, quick, because it doesn't require any math. It's just logic. And he hits like super core things of investment logic that you like never see in the classroom. So read that book. It's like 21 chapters on 21 things that are logically the most important thing in investment in various scenarios. It, it's actually, it's a book that's a framework. So I, I yeah, check it out. It's a good, good book, really good book. Uh, Bill Gurley talks about contrarian right. He gives a shout out to Howard Marks in his, uh, in his interview here. My point is, I've got three videos about the same thing. I'm not asking you to listen to the three videos. I'm just trying to use this as evidence of how important this notion of trying to think of yourself as how can I be contrarian and right? How important that is. Because it's those scenarios where you get the outsized returns. Since you were contrarian, that meant when you invested in this startup, other people didn't want to invest. What does that mean? Well, if other people don't want to invest, you can negotiate a lower price. If you negotiate a lower price that you invest in as the investor, right, you get a higher return mechanically, right? That's how you get the huge home runs. It's when no one believed in this thing and it ended up working. And as we said earlier in the semester, if you look at the performance of the average VC investment, the attractiveness of that investment is dramatically, almost entirely driven by the home runs. And the home runs are the things that were contrarian and right. So when you're thinking about building your process for investing into startups, you better in the back of your mind constantly be pinging this idea is what I'm doing likely to pick up on the stuff that's contrarian and right? If the answer to that question is no, you are much less likely to be successful in your craft.
as a VC or an angel investor. Hugely important. Right, it, that, that's how you get, that's how you get um, these outsized returns. And again, this all goes back to this idea that like, the framework is not a checklist, right? Framework is not a checklist um, because if you did it as a checklist, if you check positive on everything, other folks are gonna check positive on most of everything as well. You're not gonna be contrarian. You may be right, but you're not gonna be contrarian, so you'll just get a normal return. And when you're wrong, you'll lose everything, which is not so much fun. Um, so yeah. Um, so now the question becomes, well, ooh, well, how, how, I would, yes, I think we can all agree that we would love to be contrarian right. Easier said than done. Fair, I agree. Tough, seems pretty difficult. There would be a lot of sequoias in the world if, uh, not the trees, but the, the VC firm, um, if, uh, if it was easy to be contrarian. Well, there's just kind of some logical like conundrum in everyone being able to be contrarian and right, correct? So, um, so yeah, it's not easy. So then the question is, well, how, how can you successfully become contrarian and right? Well, the best way to become contrarian and right is to be able to forecast future opportunities so that you can start betting on those opportunities before other people realize that it's a good time to be doing that, right? So it's to become really good at the now, at that timing question that we discussed earlier. So what are some strategies that VCs use to try to forecast these opportunities? We'll talk a little bit about that next. Sound good? Before we do that, I just wanna say one other blurb. There's another way that you can earn attractive returns without needing to be contrarian and right. And that's to be uniquely valuable to the startup so that you bring value to them that no other investor brings in. If you're able to do that, you can capture some of that value. The reason why I'm mentioning that is because that motivates why we did topic one in this course. The only way for you to be uniquely valuable is for you to really understand startups, and that starts with understanding the startup life cycle. So, you know, hopefully you guys think that it all kind of connects together, you know? And that's why I think it's really weird that a typical VC textbook has two pages out of 900 on qualitative evaluation. It boggles my mind. I don't get it. You know, how can you possibly be contrarian and right without knowing shit about qualitative? My, my, I, I, my answer to that is you can't. So that's why half of the course needs to be qualitative. Sound good? This is not a venture capitalist or a startup founder. It's an artist that did this infinity mirror thing. Infinity Mirror looked to me like forecasting the future, you know, going into the distant future. I don't know why I did it. it was, I thought it was, anyway. Okay, so now what I wanna do, I'm just gonna talk about some strategies that VCs use to forecast future opportunities. Um, I actually have four listed. One is technology triggers. I'll define them um, shortly. Another one is technology trends. So we'll talk about the difference between a trigger and a trend. Another one is what talented folks, engineers, technologists are working on. Seems to suggest what might become pretty awesome in the future. Um, another one is something called the Gartner hype cycle. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about the Gartner hype cycle uh, because I actually don't believe in this one. I only put it in my notes because a couple of VCs would occasionally mention it to me but I am like a major non-believer of the effectiveness of this thing. So I've put it there. If you guys are ever curious, you can go read up on it, but you know, I don't wanna spend time in the class in this current environment doing that because I can't even say it with a straight face. So, you know, 
hopefully you guys are okay with that. So let's talk about the three that I'll actually, that I actually believe in. Um, one is technology triggers. What is a technology trigger? It's a discontinuous change in technology that tends to enable a bunch of new opportunities, either upstream or downstream from the new technology. It usually defines a new product category. Let's take an example, the personal computer, right? Once personal computers became a thing that was arguably cheap, good enough to generate something that people would be willing to like be a consumer around, right? That's basically Apple, right? In the 70s, right? Well, what gets enabled by the introduction of the personal computer? Well, the personal computer isn't a fully optimized self-contained product. It's kind of like a platform. And in order to make the platform as valuable as possible, what do you need? You need better hardware components coming in from upstream. It's nice to go and upgrade the floppy drive to a CD, to a thumb drive, to the cloud, right? These are all upstream Im improvements that make the whole platform more valuable. Well, what else do you need? Downstream, you need software to make this as useful as possible, right? You need productivity software, you need entertainment software, like video games, right? Once you have the right product in the middle, it just blooms opportunities on both sides. The best VCs pay attention to that because what they do is they try to find those discontinuous technologies. And if they can invest in those, fabulous. But if they can't, they invest in the upstream and the downstream that stem from it. If you look at Sequoia, so I have a link to a Sequoia talk here. This is Don Valentine. He's the founder of Sequoia. And he talks about his, you know, the experience with um, Apple and how investing in Apple and believing in, the, in that, the personal computer as a technology trigger made them not just invest in Apple, but they made like 15 other investments upstream and downstream. EA Sports downstream. In the upstream, they invested in a bunch of things related to um, memory and processors. It's because they realized this trigger is creating a bunch of new opportunities that can create a bunch of value. And if other people are making fun of the nerds who are look, toying around with a personal computer right now, this is a great opportunity for them because now they're contrarian. Most people are laughing at this. They're gonna laugh all the way to the bank eventually. Make sense? Now here's the thing is like, the example of the personal computer that I just mentioned, that's kind of a case where um, you have upstream and downstream opportunities, but they're kind of obvious, you know? They're not subtle. And so at this stage, everyone pays attention to technology triggers. Like when the smartphone came, people paid attention. And so people did the Sequoia playbook. Like, let's invest in a bunch of apps. Like, because of that, the app marketplace has become a zoo. It's actually tough to earn really big returns there because there's so much competition because everyone is like, I'm the next Don Valentine, baby, right? Um, so I think the world has evolved where if you want to take advantage of a technology trigger, you actually need to find slightly more subtle stuff. And this, here's my take on subtle stuff. Um, and I'll, I'm going to build that story around a trigger. Um, the trigger is going to be the smartphone. Smartphone meets cloud. So think of those two things which are happening around the same time. Now, what's the upstream and the downstream? Technology trigger, we have these two things happen. The downstream, similar to what we had with uh, Apple, 
right, was software, Zynga, Dropbox, but the problem is there's thousands of them. It is winner takes all sometimes, so that like the ones that make money make a shitload of money, but there's so many losers. You don't know what the winner and the loser is when you're investing super early. So tough to make, tough to make money there. What about the upstream? Hardware, okay, I'm, I'm not gonna focus on that here. Uh, here, actually, that's been done less by startups and more by established companies like the Qualcomm's and the ARCs of the world. It's actually tough for startups to navigate here because it requires so much capital investment to get, uh, to get hardware launched now. Anyway, like these were the things that Sequoia thought about when this was the personal computer, is what I'm saying. And a lot of people have thought about it with regards to the smartphone in the cloud, but it's been tough to make money. So like, you know, the, the, the VCs that have focused on um, smartphone gaming, they haven't like done great on average. Some of them have done great because they've like taken a bet on Epic Games or something like that, or played them, you know? But like most, most of these companies just basically struggle. So not been a good bet on average. So where is the good bet? How do we take advantage of this trigger? It's more nuanced. It's more nuanced. Let me give you a great example. So this is an example that I love, which is, I, I call this higher order opportunities. So let's think about this downstream. You've got the Zingas, the Dropboxes, all of those folks. Look, they all know it's Wild West time. You gotta, you gotta get your product out there as soon as possible, because if you're too late, you're gonna, miss the, you're gonna miss the timing. So they're in a huge rush to launch their software products. But the thing is, launching software that works great on a smartphone that, in a way that leverages the cloud, that's not a skill set that programmers have yet. Programmers are used to soft, you know, programming software that sits on the computer. And so there's a new set of programming skills that are necessary to make this software shine. You basically need to have the software work really well on the cloud and to work well in terms of quick iteration so that you can launch something with bugs and you quickly detect the bugs and you fix it and you fix it and you fix it. So in the software, there also needs to be like problem detection and stuff like that. You guys see what I'm saying? Can you see how that would be really valuable to all the Zingas and the Dropboxes of the world? Because they have a new pain point, a new programming need. And this has been given a name. It's been called application performance monitoring or APM for short. So here's a higher order opportunity is why don't we look for a startup that addresses this new pain? Because this new pain is not obvious to people who just look here and just look here. You got to like, it's kind of like, you know, you don't want to be playing checkers. You want to be playing chess or something like that. Like this is a chess move. This is a checkers move. So what's the insight around this pain point? There, there was one great insight around it, which is all those companies are in such a rush to release software that they don't have the time to build that application performance monitoring capability in-house. They don't have the time. So what don't you, what 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 was a great startup built around this insight? Let's be the outsourcing solution to this need. Let's make the application performance monitoring layer for all these people so that they can launch these things quickly. Right? You need to do it in a way where it's also scalable. So it needs to be almost all software and not be like a consulting gig. And there was a startup that did this. It was called New Relic. New Relic was um, funded by Benchmark. 
it was actually ideated inside of Benchmark um, by Peter Fenton, who was one of the great interviews about the uh, framework for people. So it was Peter Fenton and a guy called Lou Cerny. If you actually move Lou Cerny's letters of his name around, that's how you get new relic. Lou Cerny. Anyway, interesting. Not so relevant to the whole success of it all, but nonetheless, uh, Lou Cerny is Canadian actually, uh, although he studied at Dartmouth, so he left Canada too soon. Um, well, he's done well for himself. Um, this was a great idea. And New Relic eventually went public. It's an example of a, of a you know, publicly traded SaaS company right now. Anyway, I think this is a beautiful example. I think this is just awesome. Because it really gives you a sense of what you really need to do. You need to spot these opportunities, but you need to be clever to get yourself to this. This is not obvious from this, I don't think. If you wanna see other examples of this, right? Like around video games, right? Video game engines, like the Unreal Engine, or think of companies like Unity Technologies. Same thing, born out of the rush to compete among game designers, you build tools for the programmers. Because these markets, right, the video game market has exploded, right? Apparently, some adults still play video games. So, you know, that's a sign that the market has exploded. So, you know, exploding market, lots of stuff around that. Folks okay with this? So yeah, you view this as an example of exploiting a technology trigger to invest in something that's contrarian. This was a contrarian bet because everyone was betting here. No one was looking here. And when people heard that this was being done, they were like, eh, that's weird. Well, it was re weird and right. Folks okay with this? Um, another one is technology trends. Technology trends are different from technology triggers. A technology trend is, a, is more gradual improvement. Meanwhile, a trigger is like, it's, something's been re revolutionized all of a sudden. It's, it, it's like one of these things, like, you know the difference when you see it. Uh, technology trends are like, look, every year processor speed, like every 18 months processor speeds double. That's something called Moore's law. Not more as in like the crossing the chasm more, um, not Jeffrey Moore, but this guy here, Gordon Moore, who is one of the founders of Intel. Uh, this is showing you Moore's law. So this is in log scale, right? But what this is basically translating to is that from 1970 until about 2015, you see how this is kind of in a line? This is plotting different processors over time. Time, how powerful they are. This straight line is basically a line that translates to doubling the power every, every 18 months. And this was remarkably steady. That's a technology trend. Why is a technology trend interesting? Because it can, a technology trend gives you predictability in how, um, in how, you know, how things are gonna improve over time, right? So why could this be, uh, Interesting. Well, because you can look at the state of technology today and you look at stuff and you're like, well, given technology today, we cannot build this. But if this happens to computing power, if this happens to battery technology, and if this happens to the um, uh, durability of cheap materials, then all of a sudden we can build it. Well, if you know the trend for each of those three things I just mentioned, you can start to predict how long it'll take 
for technology to be ready to build this new product. See what I'm saying? And why is that useful for you? It's useful for you because if you know the product is two years away, maybe now's the time to start building it so that you've got a, a head start over others. So technology trends can be super helpful. And that's why, I mean, you'll see a lot of VCs, a lot of founders talk about trends. They'll talk about trends. Moore's law gets dropped all the time, but they also talk about trends in a bunch of other dimensions. And by the way, it's not just technology. They'll also talk about demographic trends, economic trends. So think demographic trends. What's an example of a demographic trend? Well, let's look around like kind of boring fintech. So boring fintech like I provide a financial service that, was, that you used to get from your branch bank or from your you know, financial advisor, but now I give it to you over your phone with as lit little human touch as possible. An example of that, robo-advisor. Those types of fintech players are plays on a demographic trend. Younger people don't fucking want to go to their bank and like wait in a line and like talk to some dude that a picture of like two kids and you don't want to do it. It's not fun. You know, you want to just have it, you know, if you can have it on your phone and if it's giving you the information you need in an easy way and you don't need to wait for a certain meeting at a certain hour, a lot of people just like that. They like that convenience. They're also, you know, it comes partially from, partially from the fact that they're addicted to their damn phone. But, um, you know, that has created changes, shifts in demographics. I mean, I guess in principle, you could have also demographic triggers too, when I think about it, right? But like, the, you know, we keep, you know, VCs keep, keep track of demographics big time. By the way, I have a video at the end of this, I think. Yeah. So Mike Moritz, also like a very important uh, VC at Sequoia. He talks about a variety of technological trends in this video. Uh, Peter Levine, who is a, a VC at Andreessen Horowitz, he also gives you an interesting story about computing trends vis-a-vis -vis what you call edge computing versus cloud computing. And I'm not going to tell you the difference between those things, but if you want, you can listen to this. It's a podcast, I think. Listen to this podcast or it's a blog. I don't, I don't remember. It's something, but I know about this because of this. Um, but, you know, you can learn about this. Like, I pay attention. When, like, when VCs are, telling, are, are, are sharing a story about trends, I listen. And I try to think about, like, what does that teach me about how I could identify trends? And do I believe them or do I not believe them? Because, you know, there are a bunch of trends that are bullshit you know, that don't end up materializing. I know, he looks a little bit nervous, so maybe his trend won't pop up. Like, he looks much more confident in what he's saying. Anyway, there are trends. I actually have a case, a little, a little mini example that I like to give normally, where I look at combo trends. So where an investment opportunity pops up, not from just looking at one trend, but looking at the combination of two seemingly different trends. Um, and that's specifically uh, the case of a company called Hortonworks, but I don't have time to do that today. So I'm not gonna do it. Um, you guys can be welcome to read the news article that's here. Uh, it's not a news article, it's like Wired or something like that, uh, the magazine. Um, and you could see, like, could you imagine what I mean by combo trends here? So if you have the time, read it, see if you can think where I might have been going here. And if you want, come to me in office hour, we can shoot the shit on it. And you know what? I'm going to go a step further. If you come to office hour, have done this, and you tell me what I'm thinking about, I will PayPal you 50 bucks. 50 bucks. I don't know if that's a lot of money for kids still. But I'll, I, I'm, it's official. I mean, this is going to go on my courses, so I'll do it. Um, um, 
I, I think it's actually pretty cool. Uh, but it, fun little tidbit, by the way. Remember how I told you that New Relic was kind of the idea was seeded inside of Benchmark with the help of Peter Fenton? Hortonworks was an idea seeded inside of Benchmark with the help of Peter Fenton. Want to know something else? Hortonworks and New Relic, I'm not joking. They IPO'd on the same day. It's insane. Um, Benchmark has the most legendary uh, entrepreneur in residence program in the history of mankind by like a country mile. It's, I mean, I mean, I'm, it's just, it's kind of incredible. Um, and that must mean that they are so good at forecasting future opportunities. They are like the maestros of this and that. And it's not surprising. Listen to Peter Fenton talk. Listen to uh, Bill Gurley talk. I mean, I don't know, man. I feel like they know their shit. Um, so it's impressive. That, that's why, you know, I, I, I wish I had the opportunity to meet them in person, but, you know, don't, don't think that's happening. Um, especially since Gurley is retiring now. Um, but, um, um, I mean, Andy Rakleff, right? He's the person who popularized product market fit, benchmark, right? It's like, you know, who knows whether Benchmark's success is going to last because the most successful people at Benchmark now have retired like, or, or have left Benchmark. Andy Reckleff has left. Bill Gurley has left. The most senior person there now is Peter Fenton. So now he's taking more managerial roles. And so he might be less hands-on with the Entrepreneur in Residence or EIR program. So maybe, maybe their success is not going to continue. I don't know. I don't know. But, you know, what they've achieved is amazing. And again, like, when you map out the logic, it's, like, impressive. It's super impressive. Final thing I'm going to say uh, in terms of a, a, a commonly used um, strategy for forecasting future opportunities is just get to know a bunch of talented technologists or engineers, the people who actually build the technology and look at what they're working on. Because what they put their effort in is probably likely to generate something cool in the future, right? And so it might give you a window into the future of technology. And actually, there's this great quote by Chris Dixon. That's this fellow right here. Um, yeah, so Chris Dixon, he's at Andreessen Horowitz. He actually used to be a uh, a prop trader, um, and then just moved into, a, he was actually apparently one of my best friends from college, him and I were prop traders out of college. My classmate was an intern and he was, his, Chris was his boss when he was an intern um, in, the, in, the, in the prop trading. I don't know why I told you this. I was e sending emails back and forth with him before, before lecture today, so that's probably why. Um, in any case, you know, see, he, this guy's batshit smart as well. Um, but, um, but Chris says, like, look, don't just look at what the talented people are working on. He, he goes a step further. He says, look at what they're working on on their free time. Because that's the, like, they're doing the boring stuff that makes the money in their normal time. And they're doing the kind of cool avant-garde shit in their own time. Right, so like a lot of smart people were, do, were like tinkering around with crypto, you know, five years ago. And you know what Chris did? He bought a lot of crypto, worked out well for him. Um, you know, things like that. Um, but here's the thing, is in order to do this well, you need to know where to find those people. Like you don't necessarily find them at, um, you know, on, uh, on Saint Laurent, on uh, Saturday nights, right? I think, is that where people still go? I, I, I'm past that part of my life. Um, you know, you don't bump into them at Schwartz at 3 a.m., um, right? You need to know where to find them. And actually, um, well, that's an important strategy. You know, so what, what are those things, right? Like, I mean, if you look at like the 60s through 80s, 
the places where you would go find those people would be places like these big research labs like Xerox Park, Bell Labs. It's incredible how many incre how many hugely value creating startup ideas emerged from those places. Ethernet came out of Bell Labs, for instance. Right? I mean, that's one example. I mean, the mouse came out of Xerox Park, right? Graphical user interface came out of Xerox Park, right? Those were where the talented creative tinkerers were. Um, those places are gone. They no longer exist. It's kind of sad, actually. Um, so where do we find them now? Well, now we have online places where you can see what the nerds are up to, right? Learn how to like use GitHub, search their repositories to see what's trending on GitHub. That'll give you a sense of like the stuff that these people are doing that inspire other people who are on those platforms as well, right? You start to learn like, where do I discover this stuff? Have a strategy for that. You know, there is one place where you can find some of these folks, it's academia, not necessarily as the professors and certainly not the professors of business schools. Um, but, you know, academia can be a place where you can have a pulse on what sort of cool stuff is being done too. So you know, keep that in mind, right? It's good to build a network, if only for that network giving you a glimpse on the forecasting future opportunities. So um, yeah, and as I said, the fourth strategy, you guys can read up on it. You can Google search it as well. You'll find some stuff. Um, I'm just not a believer, so I won't, I won't talk about it here. We're out of time anyway. I'm two minutes over technically. So I think we'll leave it at that. And I'll see you guys next time which I believe is not next week. I don't remember. I don't remember. I'd have to look at my syllabus. Is, is, is it next week the break? Yeah, that's why I said I don't think I'm seeing you next week. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I just okay. wasn't sure if that was true. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I, I'm pretty sure. Um, by some miracle, I had forecasted that we would be encountering remote learning pain points in the middle of October. That was me forecasting not future opportunities, future something, you know, future non-ideal state of the world, it is, or something like that. Um, for once in my life, I was right. Unfortunately, I wish I wasn't right in that case. Um, but in any case, uh, that means that I'm not gonna see you guys for a week, um, but uh, you guys can send me emails in the interim, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll respond. Again, general rule of thumb, if you email me and you haven't heard from me in two days, email me again. It just means it's lost in my inbox. There's no, no student that I will read the email and be like, I don't want to respond to them. Okay, that's never happened once in my life. So it just means it's lost. So don't hesitate. Um, but in any case, I'll see you guys in, uh, let's call it uh, 12 days or so. In the meantime, I hope you guys have, uh, uh, well, a good long weekend, a happy Canadian Thanksgiving. Uh, and, uh, you know, you take the time to just, you know, hopefully, you know, hopefully everyone is okay. And to the extent that you could be more okay, I hope you guys get maximally okay. All right? Have a good uh, Jared, do, you, do, you. do you have office hours now? It's office hours now? Maybe. It's Thursday. It's Thursday. It, yeah, okay. Uh, I guess <laughs> I have office hours then. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I just don't remember if they're supposed to start at 6 or 5.30. I, I think it's... Are you pushing okay. for 8? That, that's for ACF. That's for ACF. You, okay. you put 8 to 10 for ACF, and I think... Is, is today 6 to 7 or 5.30 to 6.30? I'm confused as well. <laughs> Whichever you prefer, we can come back at 6. No, you can stay now. I'm, I'm, I'm captive here anyway. <laughs> That's fair. Uh